Hey friends, welcome to episode 22 of The Way to IndieCast. On today's show, we fall into the groove of some good vibrations as I review Bill Polad's Love and Mercy, a striking drama based on two key chapters of Beach Boys frontman Brian Wilson's life. Stay tuned for that review at the end of the show, but in the spirit of that movie, we'll also be talking about some of our favorite music movies. Not musicals, mind you, but movies in which music and or music making plays a key role in the story. In just a bit, we'll also be talking about consensus in regards to film criticism. How important is critical and fan consensus? And why are people becoming more obsessed with it with each passing year? I'm your host, Bernard Boo. Joining me from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, is my cuddly Canadian comrade, C.J. Prince. Thank you for the uh, lovely intro and the alliteration. You know I'm a fan of that. I know you like that stuff. I, I love you alliteration. Like that stuff. Dastardly dissenter. Dastardly dissenter. <laughs> I mean, we've never met. I don't know how cuddly you actually are. I am. Uh, no, I'm. I'm pretty much a cacti, so I'm not cuddly at all. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Cuddly cacti. It's a cuddly cacti. It's an automaton. It, it, sorry, it's an oxymoron and alliteration wow. at the same time. I don't know why I said onomatopoeia. <laughs> <laughs> the wordsmiths. Uh, we're, yes. We're top-notch wordsmiths here at Way Too Indie. I'm excited yeah. for today's show, man. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I mean, the stuff's been on my mind, especially the consensus thing. Uh, yeah. That, that stuff just bothers me a lot, so <laughs> I'm excited <laughs> to get into that. But before we jump in to all that good stuff, we have to start with our indie picks of the week. CJ, what have you got for us this week? This indie pick, um, it just came out uh, this past weekend on May 29th in New York City. It's a movie that I caught back at the Toronto Film Fest last fall. And uh, I actually, my review from from TIFF got republished on the site recently, so, so go check it out. I've actually seen this film again since then, and it's one of those movies that completely snuck up on me. And when I saw it a second time, kind of out of that context of the craziness of TIFF, it, it really blew me away. And now it's it's in my top five of the year so far. Uh, it's called Tudor Nicole, mm-hmm. which literally translates to You're Sleeping Nicole. Uh, it's a Quebecois film. It premiered at the Cannes Film Festival last year, and I remember last year, everyone went nuts for uh, Mommy, you know, Xavier Delon's film yeah. in competition, but I feel like this one was, for me, just a far more... Uh, I liked it a lot more, but that's largely because I think this one was a huge surprise. Like, no one really saw this film. Uh, I came out of nowhere playing director's Fortnite. Um, I actually put it on a feature I did last year for the best films that do not have any distribution in the U.S., Thankfully, since then, it did get picked up for distribution by Kino uh, Kino Lorber Films, which just, as I said, released it this, this past weekend. The good folks uh, at Kino Lorber. For those who don't know Tudor Nicole, um, which I like to call uh, Francis Quebecois, which is, irref- <laughs> people call it the French-Canadian version of Francis Ha. Uh, <laughs> Nicole is a young, uh, I think she's like post-grad college student who um, is basically spending a lazy summer at her parents' home while her parents are away on vacation. She works a small job, but she just kind of lazes around and she gets a credit card in the mail and then she decides to uh, book an impromptu trip to Iceland with her friend. But a whole bunch of weird things start happening. Uh, You know, her brother suddenly moves back into the house for the summer with his band so they can record an album. Uh, her relationship with her best friend kind of starts going on the rocks. Um, it's a really hard film to describe in terms of plot because there's only a very tiny amount of plot, but the movie is really successful in its mood. Uh, it, it's shot on black and white, uh, 35 millimeter film, and it nails that kind of like lazy, hazy summer where you're just kind of, you know, hanging around and you don't really have anything to do. Mm. And what I love about it is, um, I call these films like late coming of age tales where it's about a character who is, you know, much older and just coming of age because she's like (laughs) about, you know, in her her mid twenties. But, um, yeah. And what I love about it is it has these like very surreal tweaks on this kind of, what I think is a really too familiar kind of film, uh, like a sub genre, if we can call it that. Um, you know, it has these really surreal and strange elements. There's a sequence I adore where, uh, Nicole's kind of walking around late at night and this car keeps driving by. It's emanating these really weird, screwed up noises. She doesn't know what it is. So she kind of, and it's going around in circles in the airport. She doesn't know what it is and she goes up 
and she looks in the car and it's a man in the car and uh, he's actually playing whale noises on his stereo because his baby is in the back seat and it can't sleep. Hmm. And it's just this like really, and, and you have to see it in motion. Like that's the thing. It's hard to describe what exactly about this movie is so charming and so uh, enjoyable. You have to kind of see it in action to understand, but it, it just nails this very specific mood and atmosphere that I think a lot of films have a really hard time doing. So um, it's in theatrical release now in New York City, as I said. Um, hopefully we'll get a home video release by the end of the year. However, uh, if you feel so inclined, the film is available on Blu-ray and DVD in Canada right now. You can go on Amazon.ca and just import it. Uh, for U.S. listeners, the exchange rate is pretty good right now, so you could probably get it for <laughs> really cheap. <laughs> so if you can't check it out, um, Kino Larber is a great company, so if it is playing around, I assume they're going to expand it. Go see it. Um, but if not, you know, if you're in a place like Sioux Falls, South Dakota, uh, <laughs> I would recommend that you uh, import it. Go to Amazon.ca and, and get it, because uh, this movie deserves all the love it can get. I'm really looking forward to this one. That's a great pick. Uh, my indie pick of the week, in keeping with the music theme of at least half of the show, is a movie called This Ain't No Mouse Music. It's a documentary about Chris Strackwitz, the 30, the 83-year-old founder of Arhuli Records, which is one of the leading roots music labels in the world. Uh, Strackwitz founded Arhuli at 29 years old in 1960 for the simple reason that he loved blues and he really wanted to find obscure blues artists and record them in their natural environment. So he'd record them on the fly, guerrilla style, kind of hanging microphones off of chandeliers and he'd bum rush small like bar shows with his recording equipment. And he'd even record the musicians playing outside, like in their backyards. It was like the most indie shit ever. And it's really cool. Chris's kind of music is what he likes to call hardcore stuff. It's gritty, uh, down-home music that's got a lot of soul and an edginess to it that almost sounds dangerous. I really like that kind of music as well, and this movie introduced me to a lot of cool bands and artists like Mance Lipscomb, who's really, really great at that kind of stuff. The movie is a kind of uh, soup-to-nuts story on, on his career, which is still going strong. He's still... Um, running Arhuli and has a record store that he has here, actually really close to where I live. Uh, most of the footage we see involves Chris grinning from ear to ear as he listens to either his favorite music on record or the kind of joyous psychological effect it has on him, uh, you know, as he listens to it. He, he, lis he listens to live music as well, and, and he's just so happy. And I think that's that's uh, the main appeal of this movie is just watching this guy enjoy life so much <laughs> by just by these people playing these really simple instruments, but very well with a uh, skill that isn't so simple. It's and it's a funny movie, too. Chris is kind of a curmudgeon. And <laughs> in one scene, he's like at a live concert and there's pop music playing on the speakers and he starts heckling the speakers. <laughs> he, he shouts, uh, Stravinsky probably would have loved this crap <laughs> like, <laughs> as people <laughs> were sitting around him. And uh, he also like punks out this poor girl at a lemonade stand because she's only allowed to put one lemon in his drink and he'd like at least two lemons. Uh, he says to his friend, they only, get, they only give you one measly lemon. <laughs> drink one lousy lemon or something. It's a really entertaining portrait of both a man and a music genre. That uh, a genre that deserves more ears on it. So, I really, I really recommend this. Ain't no mouse music. It's available now to stream on Netflix. What what era was it again? You said what what decade did it like the the founding of this whole thing to place take place? He in? founded Arhuli Records in 1960. Yeah, I was gonna say it's probably like 60s era because I feel like it's it's really fun to hear about that type of stuff because it just sounds like the wild west in terms of setting yeah. up that like all the new music genres were coming in around that time rock and roll, rock and roll you know the 50s and whatnot and then I just feel like it's I love all these like insane stories about how the how these record companies and and figures kind of came to to existence and it's a lot of crazy like I can't even believe that half of the stuff happened yeah it's it's really kind of really super cool I I, I got to interview Chris um, when the movie came out theatrically last year. And he was just a wonderful person to be around. Uh, you kind of learn, it's one of those guys you kind of learn a lot from. 
and he's although he's like pretty old like 83 years old he he's still you know really vivacious and really cool please check that movie out and also check out two door nicole those are our indie picks of the week and now cj we're getting into it we're going to talk about consensus and i think the thing that spurned this conversation or gave us the idea to have this conversation was uh your review of mad max fury road yes <laughs> that which was like a couple weeks ago right and mm-hmm. you had like one of the only negative reviews of that movie on the internet well, it wasn't much. even it wasn't even <laughs> negative no, you not see, neg- this is yeah you're movie. right you know, i know i know it wasn't <laughs> negative it wasn't negative but it you was, know what i was, mean <laughs> it was not excessively positive That's it wasn't excessively it was positive you 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 gave it like a, a slightly six. above average, slightly six above out average. of ten, which is six literally above average, and <laughs> and yet I got so much flack. I got lots of I got support. I actually had it. It was nice to see there were people on Twitter who actually were like, you know, this guy nails it, and they were being very supportive, which was very sweet. And um, so it's always nice to see that. But you know, I I've had an ongoing two week argument with someone. If you're listening, you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Where, it's not like, me, by the way. It's no, not. it's not you. No, no. It's just someone who's just like, I don't understand how you, as a cinephile, cannot appreciate the thing. That I'm like, I appreciate it. I didn't enjoy it. God. And this this stuff like kind of makes me mad, to be honest, CJ. I'm, I'm a level-headed guy. I'm kind of an easygoing dude. But this, this obsession with uh, consensus, I think, is one of the worst things that's happened to film criticism, like, in the history of, <laughs> of the... <laughs> <laughs> the the, the uh, platform but before we get into it and really dig deep i want to read off uh, this is an ir- <laughs> i understand the irony of this but i'm gonna read off a rotten tomatoes list <laughs> because we're way too indie.com <laughs> i'm but this is you know to make a point okay so this is rotten tomatoes top 10 art house and international movies so this is their adjusted score list because they had to adjust for certain variables of course because some of these movies are pretty old. So at number 11, <laughs> this is just a bonus. I had to put it in there. It's Tokyo Story by Yasujiro Ozu, the 1953 movie. I just had to mention it because it's yeah, a number of course, 11. Yes. Number 10 is The Conformist, the 1970 film by Bernardo Bertolucci. Number 9 is Seven Samurai by Akira Kurosawa. Akira Kurosawa. Number 8 is The 400 Blows by Francois Truffaut. 7, The Army of Shadows by Jean-Pierre Melville. Number six, one of my favorites ever, M by Fritz Lang. Great pick. So good. Number yes. five, Rashomon. Akira Kurosawa's back again on the, on the list. Two-timer. Two-timer. Uh, number four, Battle of Algiers by Gilo or Gilo Pontecorvo. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> nice try. God damn I don't, know how, to, I don't yeah. know how to say it either. <laughs> my best effort. <laughs> number three, another one of my all-time favorites and favorite filmmakers, Nosferatu by F.W. Murnau. Uh, number two, Fritz Lang's Metropolis. Two timer. Two timer. Number one. What do you think this is, CJ? Number one. Um, give yeah, me I, a, a decade. Give me uh, a decade. The twenties. Uh, I'm gonna say Sunrise. Ooh, I wish. Number one is The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, by Robert really? Vina. Robert Vina. I actually yeah. just watched that. I actually just watched that not too long ago. And terrific then. movie. It's, it's, these are okay so this is the whole point this is why i'm reading off yeah. rotten tomatoes top 10 is because what rotten to what this list is is this is that was fun i, I like you know taking a look at this and kind of seeing all these movies kind of ranked in this way but i think what this kind of illustrates is how big a disservice <laughs> this kind of thinking about consensus is to the art of film like the, the most artful film like these are some of the best films ever made and this is a list compiled of binary code, yay or nay votes, mm-hmm. positive or negative. And so this list really means almost nothing. And it's fun on the, it's like, you know, skin deep data that, that, uh, you know, I guess has some value, but I think it's almost, it's almost insulting <laughs> <laughs> to 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 even comprise yeah. this list because like we're talking about the 400 blows and seven samurai films that require i think if you're if you're gonna really take this art form seriously deeper conversation and investigation so that's 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 the point i wanted to start off with here i think consensus the more we get 
obsessed with everybody having a uniform opinion <laughs> about movies, the more these films actually get left by the roadside. Like they get, they get, we, we forget to talk about them critically. I would say the problem with consensus is um, you are judging films for the, for a quality that I think is kind of, I'm not going to say useless, but it's it's just the no. wrong quality to use as the kind of primary factor for judging a film, which is, is it the most enjoyed film or is it the least enjoyed? You know, like it, it's it's unnecessary because maybe, you know, as as pretentious as I'm going to sound here, a lot of great films, you know, are not necessarily enjoyable films or there are films that, you know, are tough and, you know, they may piss you off and they may do things they may like i they take risks or they do things and they fail and this is kind of a very silly idea to me you're right it's it is a very surface level uh way of establishing um you know great films or i guess not so great films but you know i mean it does it doesn't parse it, it, to me it is an insult to a film because this is films that take years and they do and they have all this effort and stuff and then it's just boiled down to you know, 90% of people said they liked it according to this metric of maybe they, they liked it this much or this much to me is just really reductive and I don't like it at all. <laughs> it's a, I think it's offensive. I mean, it's okay. So it doesn't, it's not like you said, I agree. It's not useless. Not at all. I think, no, it's not useless. It, not it, at it all. Gives it's a general barometer, but unfortunately there's this bullshit idea that if you take a collection of subjective opinions, it becomes objective. Right. And that's, completely wrong and completely off base yeah and it's and it's the funny thing is these people who get so passionate about it claim that they're like they love movies <laughs> you know and it's like if you're really passionate about consensus and like most people liking or disliking something and yelling at someone for not liking mad max fury road i mean i think it's 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 just silly you don't this is not a conversation about the movie anymore this is a popularity contest I think Not people to... have a problem accepting other people's perspectives. <laughs> like, like if they're someone else's perspective is not of their own, they just think it's worthless. But the thing is, that is the problem with um, this type of thing because it turns away from you know we can talk about the specifics. What is it a person didn't like? What is it a person did like? And I feel that's where you really get the the meat of the discussion. You can actually appreciate or uh, come to an understanding about certain things about a, a film uh, by by you know discussing that. But instead, it turned because of this whole consensus thing that oh well you're not you're more let's say the outlier because it is a statistical uh, perspective on this whole thing that it's now like well now the problem isn't the movie it's you it's like you're faulty yeah you yeah know? and that's that's completely wrong because it's it's freaking like it, it's an art form it's not you know we shouldn't be having this this mindset towards it because it just to me it just completely voids and, and um discourages people from from putting in different perspectives and viewpoints which i think is really what criticism and talking about films are all about 100 percent. and i think what's uh, you, you know what really kind of bothers me is that people get caught up in this thing of like, you know, you're wrong, CJ, like you're wrong. <laughs> you know, <laughs> your opinion about Mad Max is wrong. And that's, you know, I think everybody knows that right and wrong is, has nothing, you know, is <laughs> we're not talking about right and wrong when we're critiquing movies. And I think to really talk about this issue, you have to really go deeper and talk about film criticism as a whole and not just this consensus thing, because... Film criticism, I think, is one of the most misunderstood, you know, things in pop culture. I like people. Certain things people talk about are like, "Oh, this this critic, I trust. I trust this critic." What most people mean by that is this critic has liked the most movies that I've also liked. Like my my yeah. my favorite and least favorite movies align most with this critic, so I trust them. And I, th I think, you know, that's your person, every, that's everyone's personal, you know, whatever you can like, whatever critic you like. And that's totally cool. Cause it's your, it's whatever helps you to enjoy movies best. But for me, I think with film critics, what's, in, what's value, the biggest, most valuable thing a film critic can provide you is honesty and their idiosyncratic opinion 
it's not it's not about what they think necessarily it's about how they think how their brain works and in their writing you can kind of see them and how they've processed this movie and that's how when i say i trust a critic i mean i like their thought process i it's interesting to me the way they digest movies you know and the, even if i disagree i mean there are plenty of movies that i disagree with roger ebert on as far as like whether i enjoyed it or not but his uh critique is fascinating like for example we've got to bring up armand white we have to <laughs> yeah <laughs> i was sorry bring that, up that armand white the... Yes, so, that is the uh, elephant in the in the fake room we have here. <laughs> yeah, he's he's the imagined the, room. He's a New York based film critic who's mostly kind of known as a troll in the, in the film critic community. He's a contrarian. Uh, I don't know if he he claims he's not a contrarian. That he's just being honest. I think that's mostly true. Uh, <laughs> I think he is kind of a troll in a little bit <laughs> in, in a more than one way. But um, he it, although he gets a lot of flack, like he's the guy that gave Toy Story three like the first negative review. Um, He's a brilliant film critic, and he makes good points. For example, I love 12 Years a Slave. I really did. I, I like that movie. But he made this point that that movie is torture porn. And at first, you know, you hear that and you think, uh, no, like you're being, you're being, you know, you must be being facetious because that movie is such a piece of work, work of art. And that's was kind of, that kind of plays into his point. His point was that 12 Years a Slave, Steve McQueen's concern wasn't, slavery what his concern was was not that theme it was the theme that runs throughout all his movies which is like dread and repulsion of the body right and like torture mutilation pain and if you think about it that way it's understandable if you look at 12 years a slave that that point of view is is understandable. It's and I don't agree with it. I think that that Steve McQueen cared very much about, <laughs> about slavery when he made this movie, but it's not like Arm. My point is Armand White is not some buffoon, who's just you know making a point to be a dastardly dissenter, if you will. <laughs> yeah, he's pro it's, he's providing intelligent critique. Yes, he's. But this is the thing. It, it's not just intelligent critique. I mean, that, that's part of it. But the, I mean, the basis um, is that he is providing his perspective on it. And that is criticism. It is an individual's perspective on a film. And yeah, his, his perspective goes against uh, the grain. But to me, I like reading Arndt White's stuff a lot. Do I think he embellishes or as people say, troll? Sometimes, yeah, I, I like to say he embellishes. He's I think provocative, he, I would say. He, yeah, I mean, he, I, I would be surprised if he wasn't aware of what he was doing. He says stuff like that, and and it's no, he he's admitted it. He said that when okay. he when he called Twelve Years a Slave torture porn, that was meant as a provocative. He wanted to knock yeah. it down a peg. And that there's was nothing. Quote. And honestly, I don't see any issue with being provocative like that. I I get why people get upset, but I don't see the issue with it. He can do it. Like it, it's brings up but he's doing what i think criticism really should be doing which is it, it, it provides a, a different way of looking at a film a different way of appreciating or understanding you can appreciate a film in a certain way and, and enjoy it more or um, have a liking towards it more or you know you can get a, another perspective and you can have a better understanding of why a person may you know disagree with you on something to me that's really what the best criticism is it kind of opens your eyes to um different aspects about you know film or films in general um, but I just, there was an interview, I just pulled it up while you're talking, where uh, he just got interviewed recently, Armand White, and they asked him about 12 Years a Slave. And he referred to a line that Amy Poehler said at the Golden Globes, where she said, uh, you know, she, she went, boy, after seeing 12 Years a Slave, I'll never think of slavery the same way again. The point is, like, what did you think it was before? Like, the film, to him, didn't really, I guess, add anything to the discussion, didn't add anything to that aspect. It was, and I think he was more upset at the reaction and the way people fawned over the film as if he describes it as um, critics kind of acted like they just discovered slavery, <laughs> like that sort of thing. <laughs> and I see it. And I, and I, I'm not saying I, I completely agree with it because I think there's a denial of the, um, the, the uh, you know, technical prowess and a lot of other aspects of the film, but it's, it's a very fair point to make. Um, even and his it's a fair point and it's a well thought out point and it also the best thing about it is it gets us thinking it expands the conversation about that film which is so valuable like that I don't get how people don't see the value in that that yeah, is and that's other, fascinating and the other thing is um, the senior resume they brought up a good point which is that when Armand Waite approaches films he approaches it from an ideological perspective you know that that's 
what I like about it. It's about bringing up new perspectives. If we were so obsessed with consensus, I don't think we would really be getting anywhere. You know? Yeah. We wouldn't be really yeah. opening up the doors. It would be like, okay, great. Here's, you know, 500 people, and they're all saying, you know, Mad Max Fury Road is this awesome, amazing movie, and blah, blah, blah. It's like, great. By reading someone who has a different opinion and talks differently. But I, I think back to Gravity. And it was a film that I actually had a hard, I was pretty conflicted over because it took me a while to realize that I didn't really like Gravity, which, mm. because everyone around it was that kind of, I saw it at the Toronto Film Fest after it premiered at Venice, and it was that really ecstatic um, atmosphere. You know, everyone's going crazy over this movie, but I came away pretty underwhelmed, and I actually saw it again in theaters because I was like, what, like, what am I missing, you know? And then I realized, like, I'm not missing it. This is, I don't like it. And I remember reading a one critic, and he said that he also hated the movie. He, I didn't hate the movie, but he hated the movie and basically said to him, it's not art, it's basically a Universal Studios theme park ride. And that kind of clicked in for me. And it was nice because I enjoyed seeing that, seeing that other perspective. Now, I know people would disagree. You would certainly disagree with that, Bernard. I know you love yes. gravity, but, um, you know... I'm happy that there was another perspective, that there was someone out there, you know, who I could read and be like, oh, my God, this person, you know, I may not 100 percent agree, but they're nailing, you know, close to something that I was feeling watching the movie. It's not like, you know, with me and people would say Fury Road, they would say like um, someone said, I never trust your opinion on Blockbuster. Someone told me that they said, I will never trust your opinion on Blockbusters. Um, you're not you're not a guy I go to for that. And that I found funny. Um, because it's just this dumb arbitrary categorization, but, and then another person said that, you know, recommending films to me is a waste of time, um, because I'm so negative and I hate everything about blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And once again, I'm like, <laughs> like, it's, it's just funny because it's like, I'm not, do I, it's like, do you honestly think I go into a movie like wanting to hate it? No, I'm spending an hour and a half, two hours, maybe more depending on the film. I'm dedicating my time and attention I don't really, I'm not really going to be happy if, you know, I come out of there and I'm not, you know, I didn't enjoy it. What, what, like, you know, no, but, I don't okay, think. Okay, so this is, this goes into my next point, which I think we should talk about yeah. um, before we move on is, is, speaking of consensus, there's the other side of it. So there's people who love being, you know, a part of the pack and, you know, having all that backup with their, <laughs> with their opinion that 99% on yeah. Rotten Tomatoes who like, well, I'm right because look at that number, you know, <laughs> There's a bunch of other people that uh, they say they feel the same way. I don't think that's true. I think everyone has very different opinions on films. You, you can't just categorize as good or bad. That's ridiculous. Um, no, not every good review is created equal. That's, that's almost a joke to me. But uh, yeah, my point is there are those people, but there are also people who do. And I know you don't do this, but there are people who do purposefully troll and go against the, the consensus like the majority and that they're just as i think they're just as culpable as the, as the people who are on that bandwagon thing because they, they're the whole the whole thing that's wrong about this is that they're letting other people's opinions weigh way too heavily on their own opinion mm -hmm. that is and and the person who is dissenting on purpose you know and trying to be a rebel or whatever. And we, we all know people like this who just, you know, hate on popular things because it's, they think they're cool or something. Contrarians. Um, contrarians. Uh, I think they, they're just as guilty. <laughs> they're basically doing the same thing as, as other people. I think, but I don't think the issue that you're talking about is, is really that like crazy prevalent. I think, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. It obviously exists. There's that kind of need for, you know, um, that kind of, you know, one side and the other point counterpoint, whatever you want to call it. These people do this. I definitely, uh, will sometimes, on on, you know, with friends or online, like say Twitter or something, will definitely go a little, <laughs> definitely will kind of just say things for the fun of it, just to rile people up. And, but it's, you know, it's, I try to be very aware about it. Like, you know, I'm just saying shit, talking shit, but, um, I, I think I it's exactly the same. I think it's exactly the same. It is the same, but I think that the the issue with the railing against consensus is far worse because it's way more prevalent than the issue of, you know, someone who's just railing against for the sake of it. I don't think that's nearly as, as no. That's everywhere. That's especially on for people who are on our site. 
like film snobs like that, <laughs> that, like that, that is like <laughs> I'm sure someone listening to this is one of those those people who just wants to be the smartest guy in the room. I mean, you know why I can tell is when I'm out like at a bar or something and someone's everyone's talking about how much they loved whatever like the Avengers or something. And then that one guy starts going off about how much he hated it. And he's smiling really big as everyone's getting mad. Like, like he's not really... doing that to be like an honest, like, you know, to actually contribute. He's, he's trying to be an asshole. Like he's, <laughs> he's maybe he didn't like it, but he's being an asshole. <laughs> I sympathize. I, but I sympathize to it to some degree because I, 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 I've definitely done it. I think everyone has done it at some point in their lives where they kind of, you know, gleefully, uh, you know, rile people up or try to rile people up. Um, it's fun. It's for kicks. But I don't know. I feel like I, I've never been a fan of um, I, I'm totally guilty of this, but I, I hate the idea of um, people being more reactionary towards the film. You're not reacting towards the film itself. You're reacting towards the reaction towards the film. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's really what it boils down to. You're sick of pe- seeing people fawn all over something, so you're going to uh, rail against it. I've had that plenty of times. There are movies I, I've seen, and I was like, you know, it was okay. But then people would go nuts about it, and I would be like, what the hell is wrong with everyone? Like, why are you going nuts about this? It's so, like, you know, mediocre or not really memorable to me, and yet people were going ballistic about it. I think, um, and that's the thing. I, I don't like it because I feel like, you know, everyone can interpret films in their own way. Um, and it, I, I feel like it makes people feel bad or anxious or, or wrong about having their own opinion on something, you know, that well, your it's opinion hard both does ways, not. right? Like it's, it's hard because like someone who sees that everyone loved this movie or whatever for them to be like, Oh, I better love this movie or else I'm not going to be cool, you know, and like go along with the crowd and overstate how much they love it. That's bad. But it's also bad if someone sees everyone loves it and goes, I'm going to overstate how much I disliked it. That's just as bad. It's the same think, thing. But both of the things you just got, I don't think that's really like a huge, huge thing. I think that it's kind yes, of. Yes, it that... is. Yes, it is. Every <laughs> I can hear it in the way people talk about movies. <laughs> like every, everybody talks like that. Every, everybody's trying to make they're trying to like win this war of inches. Like about the conversation oh, of these. If you're talking about that, um, sure, but I think that's more reflective of like the kind of um, how do I put it? It's I'm thinking of sanding. That's a bad. That's a bad image. But like it's just kind of like buffering, buffing, and kind of taking away the nuance uh, of certain uh, of you know film of films and art and discussion. You know, it's just boiling it down to as I said, point counterpoint, which I can't stand. I, I think, and I think that's largely what the issue really is more so than. The person itself i think that you know every like you said it's binary with the rotten tomatoes list that's kind of the way everything is everyone's kind of instructed <laughs> to approach things i think if we want to get rid of that issue that should be where it should be addressed but it's going to be you know that that's unfortunately it's kind of a necessary evil um i, I remember t- i was telling you how like i i had a little weird anxiety about the mad max fear road review going up because i knew it was yeah. going against consensus and i was like I really don't want to, you know, have people start railing against me and shit. But I was surprised because people who did talk to me were actually pretty. Um, they, 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 they were very respectful and kind of substantive about just like when they talked about, they actually were responding to, you know, things they said. I had some people who didn't, but for the most part, I was actually surprised and kind of glad that people were responding to actually the points I was bringing up, and <laughs> like my actual yeah. thoughts, and not just like that. So, I, but you know, I, I liked your of, review. I mean, I love Mad Max, but I also loved your review consensus i think for certain uses it's like if someone is you know trying to some mom and dad are trying to figure out what to take their (laughs) kids to on the weekend (laughs) it is i think that's totally useful 100 percent. i don't think that's bad but i think when we're talking about critique when we're talking about serious conversation about movie and people who love the art form as an art form we should not even be looking at rotten tomatoes (laughs) we shouldn't be looking at it it should be it should be unfortunately um that sort of thing should be taken with the the tiniest grain of salt the kind it is a general right. barometer of like okay people are liking this people are, but now it's turning into gospel you know people are so the arm and white example with toy story 3 people were so taking it personally that you know how dare he ru- ruin this 100 percent average it's like who gives a yeah, shit what the fuck? like what the fuck 
Why? It's the shit. <laughs> like why? Like I just like I just imagine this person like my my aggregate. Like who cares? <laughs> <laughs> who gives a shit? There are other things to do in life. Yeah. So I mean that I yeah I think that it's it's really reductive and and I think in the long run it's going to be very poisonous to uh, discussion. Yeah. It's, or one criticism. One of the, it's one of the major kind of weapons against uh, film criticism that's kind of sinking the ship here. I think so. That's that's our discussion of <laughs> consensus with regards to film criticism. Yeah. Guys, please let let us know what you think. Yeah, tell uh, us if you agree or disagree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yay or nay. Give us a thumbs up. Yay <laughs> or nay. <laughs> but uh, we'd love to, I'd love to continue, continue this conversation later on, but we've got to move on now. We're going to be taking a tiny break, but after the break, we're going to be coming back with our discussion of our favorite music movies. See you in a little bit. You're listening to the Way Too Windy Cast, the official podcast of WayTooWindy.com, where you'll find film news, reviews, and interviews with an emphasis on indie. Follow us on Twitter at WayTooWindy and like us on Facebook. Hey guys, welcome back to the Way Too Indie Cast. I'm Bernard Boo, sitting here with CJ. I'm not actually sitting with you, CJ, but we're e sitting. <laughs> It's spirit e sitting and an e friend sitting e sitting with friends. e me. We're e cuddling by the e fire. <laughs> As we this talk has about... just turned e disturbing. <laughs> We're talking about our favorite music movies. Uh, this week we've got Love and Mercy coming out, Bill Polad's movie about Brian Wilson, and I'll be reviewing that at the end of the show. But in honor of that movie. We'll be talking about other movies that are kind of about musicians and the kind of turbulent life lives of, of musicians and stuff like that. There's, this is kind of a broad uh, subgenre or genre of movies that I, I a lot of my favorite m- movies fall into this. Uh, CJ, yes. what? Give me one. Okay, my favorite. I think of all time, and I'm I'm not Ooh. one to be very declarative or of those. Uh, the one movie that I feel incredibly objective on, where I'm just like, this is straight up the best. Not music movie, but concert movie ever. Wait, let me... Okay, I think I know what you're going to say. and it, Say it. Stop making sense. Yeah! That's it. It's like... Yeah! I, I feel like I, it's just the one thing where I'm just so passionate about, where I'm just like, there's nothing can beat that movie in terms of concert movies. I've seen plenty of great concert movies, but I feel like that's, at least as of now, the king. <laughs> you know? Nothing has come... Uh-huh. And nothing has beat that standard. There is... I, I always love bringing up the... There's this one moment, you know, when you're watching the, the movie and towards the end, I think it's like the last song or, or the second last song, um, it suddenly will do... It suddenly you start doing audience cutaways and it never did that throughout the entire movie. And then when it did that, it was just like this jarring moment because it really feels like you're just watching this concert and you're there. And then when it does that cutaway, you're like, oh, like, I don't know. It just, it, it threw me out where it's kind of... It was this kind of ingenious, like, way to kind of break the, you know, the spell of the movie while I was watching it. 100%. Uh, that, that movie, of course, directed by Jonathan Demme, um, who did such a... This this is... I, I think there's something magical about this movie that I can't... You can't put your finger on it. But I think it's because it's really cinematic, and it almost feels as if the setup... And, like, Burn comes out alone at first, yeah. and then the show kind of evolves from there with more instrumentation being introduced and there's yeah i think he he it was almost designed to be cinematic which a lot of concert movies are not it's almost like the cameras are trying really hard to work you know work with what the musicians and the 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 set people are doing yeah it's it feels like um i guess i would say it as like you know whereas a lot of concert movies feel like they're they're trying to capture in the moment there's there's a there's a definite feeling of things being set up and, and yeah. deliberately designed and stuff. Stop There's an orchestration. Stuff. Yeah. And, and also what's even more amazing is that, you know, it is orchestrated it is, you know, you can tell it's, um, you know, designed and stuff, but it completely nails that feeling of being in a, a, a being at a really great concert. Yeah. 100%. And that's one of the best documents of one of the best bands. Yes. Ever. Yes. Uh, my, first pick is a movie that is, is so beloved to me. It's a 2008 film directed by Sasha, Sasha Gervasi that follows a Canadian heavy metal band <laughs> called Anvil. I'm, I'm, no, I'm laughing because I don't know why, but I thought you were going to say Sasha Baron Cohen. And I was like, what? Because <laughs> you said Sasha? And I was like, 
Oh yes, Anvil. The story Anvil, of Anvil. The story of Anvil. Uh, now back in the mid '80s, Anvil was kind of a big deal. They made killer metal records. They were pretty popular, and they were considered like on the same caliber of bands like White Snake and Bon Jovi, for whatever that means in 2015. <laughs> but <laughs> tons of musicians have cited them as major influences on their music, like Slash from Guns N' Roses, Lemmy from Motorhead, Lar- Lars Ulrich from Metallica. But sadly, that band never really went anywhere, and the movie catches up with the band in the present day, which at that time was 2008, uh, kind of playing tiny clubs with, like, the audience is kind of just their friends, pretty much, <laughs> that have, like fans that turned into friends because they're yeah. the only people who show up. And um, they're working menial jobs, and they're leading more ordinary lives than you'd have expected knowing their explosive beginnings in the 80s as a band. And the film follows them as they attempt to make kind of a comeback. They record... Uh, a new album or they they're in the process of recording a new album and during this process the guys kind of hash out a lot of their differences and have a few fights that you know kind of in a weird way like are kind of funny from the outside <laughs> looking in because they seem so um insignificant from the outside but getting to know them is a lot of fun because they're really weird kind of awesome dudes the lead singer is and lead guitarist his name is steve lips kudlow uh, most people just call him Lips. Lips. <laughs> He's the most r- ridiculous looking guy. Look up, look him up on yeah. Google. Uh, early in the film, uh, he takes you on a tour through his house. And at one point, there's this picture hanging on the wall of shit in a toilet. Just poop in a toilet. <laughs> and he points to it with this innocent kind of dopey grin. And I kid you not, I laughed harder at that than anything that happens in This is Spinal Tap. <laughs> I laughed so hard when he pointed at that toilet bowl with shit in it. I had no idea why that was on his wall <laughs> to this day. He's <laughs> proud of it. Yeah, he's just so proud of this photo of this like great little, photo. Like, <laughs> it's like a little kid gone mad who's just like, look what I made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, Anvil plays out like a real life version of This is Spinal Tap. And uh, the thing about this movie is the ending is killer it's an awesome ending that will leave you satisfied guaranteed yeah and and funnily enough i think that that kind of it's an influential documentary i think because since then a lot of documentaries like it have come up like uh the, the, as i call them the musical discovery documentaries where it's <laughs> <Yeah>. like <laughs> searching for sugar man searching for sugar man <laughs> a band called death um all those sort of things uh, i'm trying to think of what else i watched one for south by southwest recently um I'm kind of annoyed with them by now, but there are some really good ones. So I'm not. The Wrecking Crew was a recent one, which honestly that was great. I I, I Damn maybe it, I'll, I'll I'll tell you my, I'll tell you my thoughts later. <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to do get with the bandwagon. Yeah. Hop on already. I did for about thirty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay. So what's what are some other picks? Okay, I'm gonna go with the most cliched, obvious pick for recent movies. Let's say I'm gonna go with Once. I am yeah. a total softy for that movie. I know some people can't stand it. Granted, I haven't seen it in a very long time, so maybe I would hate it if I saw it now. But when I saw it all those years ago, it totally won me over. I love seeing a musical that was actually about performance, live performance, that kind of intimate uh, performance. The two leads obviously have amazing chemistry. They're a great team together. It won you know, the Oscar for that recently been revived um you know because of the of its broadway play mm-hmm. um which i think had its first run in toronto it's nice. still playing in toronto i i, I have yet to see it but i really want to go because you know it's just i want to a... go too it's playing in, it plays in san francisco as well yeah it's probably moving because it's, it's been playing forever and i've just i've completely uh missed out on that one but um, i'm sure it'll come back but it's you know it's just this really lovely movie i don't know like i i, I like i it, it, you know a movie where you just you just kind of like oh i just love this movie like everything about it is i'm really enjoying it. oh it's Crazy. easy to give in yeah the, yeah easy. like the music the acting the charm the, so the, pleasant <laughs> the, pleasant, the, the lo-fi you know feel of it and i think the end you said anvil has a killer ending i think once has a really amazing ending yeah. too it's a really emotionally just satisfying ending and of course you know um i never got to see uh their their kind of follow-up where it followed the two of them as they went on tour afterwards i think they're called the swell season or whatever the swell season yes they actually became a couple after filming once and then eventually broke up but still were making music together i don't know how that works kind of weird fleetwood mac situation going on (laughs) but um, 
<laughs> well, yeah, once is just, I, I feel like it's now become uh, canon to some degree by people, but yeah. I am a big fan of, of the movie. So, Yeah, I think another one that uh, is probably on a lot of people's list that's definitely on my list is High Fidelity, starring John Cusack, uh, appropriately for a movie that's coming up later later on with love and mercy but uh yeah yeah high fidelity was a movie that i watched when i was younger and really was kind of starting to think that vinyl was cool <laughs> and stuff like that uh it's about like cusack plays this guy this record store owner who's having girl problems and he's got a lot of buddies at his record store played by like jack black and uh todd something I I forget what his last name is, but I forget too. It's a great hangout movie and there's a lot of great music in it. And John Cusack, I think this is for his later roles. This is kind of one that he fits into like, kind of like a glove. Like I feel like he acts like Rob in real life, probably (laughs) kind of this slouchy kind of sad sack kind of guy. (laughs) Um, It's by Stephen Frears, that movie. And yeah, I really, I really treasure that one. And I think, Jack Black's performance at the end of the movie is just so sweet and really makes me happy to this day watching it. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to uh, disappoint you right now because I have not seen High Fidelity, so I cannot comment. That's not disappointing. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just haven't seen it. Yeah, I okay. did just recently I someone showed me a scene from it recently. Uh that I think it's the one remember he uh, puts on I think it's the beta band their EPs and he like tells me he's like I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell, sell five copies yeah, yeah five copies of the beta band three EPs yeah, <laughs> yeah three EPs <laughs> such a great scene it's a great scene man yeah all right um what am I what is wrong with me how could I forget this movie I saw this when I was about 12 and I loved it and I'm showing my age but not really I went out and I bought a VHS of it right away <laughs> <laughs> As in a flea market, I saw a VHS. I said, I'm going to buy it. Um, the Blues Brothers. Yeah. Classic. 2000, right? Uh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> you piece of shit. <laughs> Just on you. How dare you? Yeah, I'm not going to... Like, What am I going to say? It, it, is, it is a classic for the obvious reasons. It's an awesome freaking movie. And I think... Um, John Landis. Made, you know... <laughs> Top of his game back then, just amazing things. Still, some of the best, if not the best, uh, car chases, car crashes. So craziness good. On the screen. And that movie like, had just had a great vibe. Just had a great. Oh vibe yeah. To it. <clears throat> Still one of my favorites. Yeah, that's. I really loved that movie when I was younger. Um, here's a more recent one. Uh, Whiplash. God damn. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. I God wasn't damn. sure if I was gonna bring. I wasn't sure. If it, I wasn't. I was like, does it qualify as a music movie? I'm not sure. But... How would it not qualify? As a no, music... I mean like, I, because I'm thinking I, because you know it's like kind of like does it have to just be about music? Or does it actually have to like have you know music throughout? Not necessarily musical. Like Once is not a musical, but it has music. anyway. Fucking you whiplash. Know, all these listeners are just like, please keep talking about this. Yes, Whiplash. It's amazing. Um, I I was so happy watching that movie. I was just like. This I like I told you this I, I've said this so many times I I was watching it with with someone and I just turned to him at the end of the movie and I went that's a fucking movie. Yeah, yeah, that's how I it's put a, it. No, that's true, but that's a true statement because that movie. If you watch, I have plenty of interviews, or I have plenty of interviews. There are plenty of videos <laughs> of my interview with director Damien Chazelle on that movie, and oh, I talk to him and I I tell him you know that is a fucking movie because. It's so cinematic. It's so cinematic. The the speaking of last scenes, the last scene of that movie is electric. It is electrifying, yeah. and there's no no barely any words spoken. When there is a word spoken, it's like almost used as a musical note in the filmmaking. Um, the editing is musical, yeah. not just there's music being played for sure, but the editing has a tempo to it, and it rises and falls, and 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 there there's a groove there that Damien Chazelle and his team fall into so well uh jk simmons oscar winner for this movie yes. deservedly so i mean that uh, no one is going to everyone just kind of pushed aside a space in their head for that performance yeah and he's gonna live in everyone's fucking mind yelling at them that they're not on his tempo forever like to yes. <laughs> till the end of time uh yeah yeah whiplash i, I don't we always talk about this movie i'm gonna leave oh, it yeah. at that but uh wonderful wonderful Great. movie movie uh, that completely understands its subject matter and breathes and lives it. 
That's oh, what I'll say. God. It's so dangerous. And yes. yeah, it's it, even in that in that practice room. Oh, I'm not even going to keep going. It, yeah. Ooh, it feels like <laughs> you're in a firing say. squad. In, That's all I want to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, what are some other? So I think The Devil and Daniel Johnston's a great one. Yep. Um, really, really fascinating movie. Dig is a classic. And uh, I'd say Fantasia is an early one for me. Talk yeah. talking about being cinematic, uh, that movie barely has any words at all. It's it's just it, it's just cinema. It's images and sounds working together to create, you know, a moment. You think uh, anything? I do you think anyone could like? Do you think Disney could? I know they did Fantasia two thousand, but I have mm-hmm. a hard time thinking anyone's gonna make a movie like Fantasia. Put it out like a major thing like that again. Talk about that movie is okay. So let's. People, tell me if you agree. CJ, tell me if you agree. I think that movie's fucking indie. That is indie, man. It represents the, you know, the indie quality of it. It's very singular. It's very its own thing. Yeah, you there's know? nothing else like it. It's it's yeah. it's wonderful. I the and it's it's scary and it's uh it's it's sparks the imagination. Well, uh, yeah, that's those are some of our favorite music movies. I think you know there's so many guys. Tell us what we missed. I'm sure we missed a ton, CJ. Spring Breakers. Oh, man. CJ, thank you for joining me for these conversations. This was fun. I really like this one. It's fun, yes. It, it, I, had a, I had a good time. I didn't think I actually would have a lot to discuss music movie-wise because it's something I don't really think of. And uh, no, there are a lot of great music movies. He reminded me. I got to watch. I should watch Fantasia again. Oh, should... Fantasia is just enchanting. Uh, thanks for joining me again, CJ. We can find you at... At CJ underscore Prin or CJ underscore P-R-I-N. On Twitter. And uh, after another little break, I'm going to be reviewing Love and Mercy. Do you know who this man is? Brian Wilson. Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. Ah. Uh, <laughs> you didn't mention that. Well, because that stuff doesn't matter. That's ego stuff, you know? Are you kidding me? I... I... I love your music. I grew up on it. Thank you. That makes me feel really good, Melinda Ledbetter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Good enough. Ledbetter. Right? It's a nice name. Uh, why don't you get started on the paperwork, okay? That was a clip from Love and Mercy, Bill Polad's drama about the life of Brian Wilson, the frontman from The Beach Boys. The film stars Paul Dano as a young Wilson and John Cusack as an older Brian Wilson. The film also stars Elizabeth Banks as Melinda Ledbetter, Wilson's eventual wife and soulmate, and also stars Paul Giamatti as Dr. Eugene Landy, who for many years exploited Brian Wilson and kind of fed him pills and medication and took advantage of Wilson and his wealth. The film isn't a biopic. It takes two slices of Wilson's life, one being the period where he was recording Pet Sounds when he had retired from touring with the Beach Boys and focused all of his energy on recording what would become one of the greatest albums of all time. The other slice of life comes from later, when he was much older and much more psychologically damaged, when Dr. Landy was, of course, taking over his life and Miss Ledbetter tries to save him from the clutches of the uh, evil psychologist or psychiatrist. Um, The film hops back and forth between these two time periods, and it's done in a really graceful way that creates this sense of psychological disorientation that has colored Wilson's life. I'm not sure we could ever understand what this man went through as he lived his life Uh, taking different kinds of drugs and dealing with terrible anxiety. But this film approximates what that might feel like. And Wilson did have some involvement with the production. So that lends some authenticity to the movie. I really enjoyed the way Paul Dano played Wilson. Uh, He's a dead ringer for him physically. He looks just like him. I actually confused him for the real Wilson in the promotional material for this film. I thought it might be a documentary. When <laughs> I glanced at the picture of Dano. Cusack does not look like Brian Wilson at all. Uh, that I'm just going to say that. I spoke to director Bill Polet and he insists that he does look like him at least a little bit. 
I didn't buy it. It kind of got in the way for me because not only does Cusack not look like Wilson, he doesn't look like Dano either. So when we're jumping back and forth, it's jarring. But Cusack's performance is very, very good. He plays a great Brian Wilson, even though he doesn't look like him. And though it took me a while, I did, I was able to let that go and enjoy his performance and what he lends the movie, which is quite a lot. There are great moments in this film, especially for me. Uh, I'm a huge Beach Boys fan. My wife actually walked down the aisle to God Only Knows, which is my favorite song and what I think is the best song of all time. And in fact, there's a scene where Dano is sitting at a piano. He's playing the piano. He's actually playing the piano and singing God Only Knows. It's the scene where he's writing God Only Knows. And that made me very emotional, admittedly because I have such ties to that song, but also because it's very well done. Polad's a uh, skilled filmmaker, and the fluidity of this movie is a testament to his talent. People who are familiar with the lore of the Beach Boys are familiar with the studio sessions for Pet Sounds, very famous sessions that were recorded and released on a box set, which I've owned since I was very young. Um, there, there are these recordings of Brian Wilson kind of yelling at his musicians, uh, not necessarily in an angry way, kind of in an agitated way. And in this movie, the fact that Paulette recreates these sessions in the actual studio where they happened is just wonderful to watch. And they work well cinematically as well. And they inform the narrative in a meaning meaningful way. The difference between this movie and other movies about people who hallucinate and have mental problems is that Wilson's hallucinations weren't visual. He wasn't seeing things, he was hearing things. So the audio, the sound production of this movie creates these sonic hallucinations. He'll hear voices. He'll hear songs that he hasn't written yet, snippets of them. It's, there's a shot where he's laying on the hood of a car uh, staring off into nowhere and we hear all these sounds swirling around the speakers and it's very loud and abrasive weirdly beautiful but mostly abrasive and it takes you to this place where sound is frightening but also enticing like it's beckoning you from the beyond. It puts us in Wilson's head. Great job by Bill Polad. Elizabeth Banks is very good in this movie as well. She has great scenes with Paul Giamatti, who plays Landy, and is, you know, good in everything, really. He he's always adds something to whatever film he's in. In this movie, he is terrifying when he's biting Brian's head off and yelling at him when he's hungry like brian wilson uh, john cusack's brian wilson will say i'm hungry i'm hungry and uh dr landy will yell at him and say no you're not and can slap him in his face and say you're not fucking hungry it's all in your head really terrifying stuff and he plays a great heel a great villain you really hate him although it's not too over the top too cartoony it's just right i recommend you guys see Love and Mercy. If there was one thing that might deter people from enjoying this one, it's that Cusack's physical appearance. It was, it was distracting for me, but I have to tell you, please try your best to ignore it because his performance is very, very good. And once you get over the resemblance issue, the movie really clicks into place. It took me a while, but I'm telling you right now, try your best to ignore that because he earns the spot that he's given love and mercy build the whole ad go see it i had a great time on the show today thanks to cj for joining me and talking about our favorite music films and also critical consensus and how important or unimportant that is let us know your thoughts on this episode i'm sure a lot of you have differing thoughts on what we talked about especially in the first half of the show Follow me on Twitter at BJ underscore Boo. Follow CJ at CJ 
underscore Prin. Follow way to Indie at way to Indie and like us on Facebook. You can also follow us on Instagram and Spotify and YouTube, and also subscribe to the way to Indie Cast on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. It's been a good time. Stay indie, everybody, and I'll see you next week. Thank you.